Well, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back at ECU. I was actually here a couple weeks ago for, any, any of y'all already done the etiquette dinners? All right, so I've, uh, I've had opportunity to be at a couple of those, and one of, one of them was recently. Uh, in fact, there was a guy that I saw in the hall. He was in around at my table at the last one, but he must be in a different class. Uh, there, there he is. Um, so, look, uh, it's, it's great to be here. So what I'm going to kind of do, I know y'all probably aren't used to having a video that I was asked about that a while ago. I, I'll kind of mention that in a, in a few minutes when I start tell, tell, telling about my story and more, more so on the business side of it. But I just kind of get a, a little feel. How many of you are seniors in the room? Okay, how many of you are juniors? Okay, and that's pretty much everybody, right? Any sophomores? I, I, I thought it was just juniors, seniors. Uh, and, and my understanding is, right, Ms. Carroll, that most of what y'all been talking about in this class are a lot of the soft skills related to business from uh, etiquette to small talk to the, the dinners to the resume building, right? I was actually surprised to hear about the resume because I just think there's going to be a day – I, I was thinking it would happen already, but there's going to be a day soon where I think the resume is just obsolete. I do think it's good practice for you to have, but now that y'all have been forced to have these LinkedIn profiles, between that and my Google search of you and checking out Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, I'm going to know more about you for you more than you're going to know about us uh, by the time you get into a room with me. And I think that's the way most employers are. But I think it is good practice because you have to have an idea of what they're looking for. You need to put down on paper some very basic things that you've been involved in and done. How many of y'all have actually done an internship already? How many of you have one planned in the next, within the next year or next summer already? I'm going to highly encourage you to do that. I'm going to highly encourage you to do that. I worked at Target, and I don't, I don't, it was for a year and a half, but when I, when I think about the time when I was here at ECU, I always say it was through two Christmases, because if you've ever worked in retail, do you know what goes into pre pre preparing for Christmas and afterwards. So I always say I worked through two Christmases at Target. Uh, so let me tell you first, uh, uh, Aletha's in the back. Uh, Aletha works for me in the office. At, at, she's the vice president of operations. And uh, Abby uh, and her mother are here. Abby's doing some video work for us. And I, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in um, in a little bit. But I do want to say thanks for, for coming today. Uh, and also connect with me on LinkedIn and all those other social media, I, every one of them. The only one I'm not on yet is TikTok, although I do have I do have a profile there. I did a video of my, my daughter about a year ago. So I, I have an idea of how it works, but it's BJ Murphy 360. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, all of them that way. Um, in fact, I even got a website there uh, now. Let me tell you a little bit about my story, and I'll talk to you a little bit about business, and then I'll kind of give you some, uh, some admonition, I guess, as, as you think about next steps in life. Uh, and then I'll kind of, if, if time permits, and I hope it's not too hot, uh, we'll do some Q and A. Is that fair enough for everybody? Uh, so, so be thinking as we kind of go along. Feel free to. I can only share so much in forty minutes or so. Uh, I I could talk all day, but I know that uh, that doesn't make sense. Nor nor will you be here. Uh, so, kind of about me. I grew up in a public uh, school system in Kinston, Lenore County. Anybody ever been to Kinston before? Awesome, awesome. And uh, I grew up there. I went to uh, LCC my first year. It was the best educational decision I ever made because I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. I just knew that I really enjoyed business, computers, and politics. And so I went to LCC. Then I had a younger sister who then was going, she was a year behind me in school. She got a five-year MBA program uh, at Campbell. So she was leaving the house at the same time I was finishing my freshman year. And I said, well, I can't let my little sister go off to school and not me. So I went to East Carolina when she went to Campbell. And then by the time I was a senior, I was at ECU, had a sister at Campbell, another sister at NC State. As long as it wasn't Carolina, we were good as far as I was concerned. Uh, and uh, so, so that was the way our, our family dynamics. When I got out of college, uh, I had done an internship with a downtown organization. It was kind of like downtown economic development revitalization where you take these old buildings and you try to figure out how to redevelop them. And you work with the, the mayor and the, the governing bodies and the business owners and property developers. And you try to figure out how, how to make that work. Kind of like uh, anybody, anybody from like Farmville or uh, Edenton, uh, anybody seen, um, uh, what's it, S S Salisbury, a beautiful downtown. Those are the kind of projects that I worked on a lot. I mean, I was 23, 24 years old doing that, had about a half a million dollar budget, a 30,000 square foot small business incubator. So we rented out spaces to entrepreneurs to help get their, get their business going. So I did that for, uh, ran a restaurant for a couple of years, and then I did that for a couple of years, and then I went into sales. 
And I went into sales because I really didn't know what I wanted to do still. I just knew that that where I was in my my profession, I kind of capped and I just needed something to kind of just expand my my uh, comfort zone just a little bit. So if if calling business owners cold doesn't expand your comfort zone, I don't know what will because it is it is a daunting task trying to sell somebody something when they didn't want it in the first place. That's why we call it sales, you know, because if people really want it, they would just come buy it. But when you have to sell them, you have to under, you have to show the the problem. You have to agitate the problem just a little bit. Then you have to overcome it by showing your product, and then you have to actually ask for the sale. And that's what I did for a decade. And because of my experience in, in Kinston uh, with the, the government and politics and my B2B experience in the real world, at 25, uh, there was an interesting opportunity that came up in my hometown. Uh, the gentleman who had been mayor for the uh, past, um, gosh, he'd been mayor for uh, the last eight years, was running for office again. And he was in his late 60s, early 70s. He'd been serving for mayor for eight years. He'd been on council for eight years before that. He was being opposed by the guy who was the mayor before him, who had been mayor for 12 years. So between these two guys, they had served for 20 years, right? Well, this other guy was in his mid to late 70s. Now, I have a tremendous amount of respect for both men, right? And someone one day, I tried to convince somebody to put their name in the hat for mayor because he was a real rebel rouser, and I thought it would just be fun to watch this, this kind of show uh, unveil itself. Uh, but he actually turned the table on me. He said, but BJ, you've actually got some of the skill set that people would probably like in being their mayor. I was like, but I'm only 25. He said, that's even better. Nobody's going to expect you to win. Right. And so I did, I filed for mayor at 25 and, and I lost, but the really cool thing about it was out of 4,200 votes only lost by 300. And so to think that some 25 year old kid actually had the audacity and actually came fairly close to winning was a really cool experience for me because I learned a lot about me. I learned a lot about people that su would support me. In fact, have you ever heard of a congressman, uh, a guy named uh, G.K. Butterfield? He called me. I'd never met him. He called me the week I lost. And he said, BJ, he said, and we're in different parties. And I'd never talked to him. I don't even know how he got my phone number. But he called me and he said, don't ever forget the people who voted for you. He said, because at 25, you did that well, those people will always support you. Does that make sense? If somebody's going to support you that kind of a race, they're always going to be there for you. And he was right. At 29, I ran again and won and became the youngest mayor in Kinston's history. Uh, and actually, the, the, honestly, the first Republican in over 100 some years. But in my opinion, my, my pitch to the community was party doesn't matter when you're talking about potholes. Right. That's, we don't we don't deal with wars in Iraq. Right. We don't. That's not what we do. We're fixing potholes. We're trying to make sure our, our kids are safe when they go to school. And that's all we do. And so I actually got a chance to serve for eight years, and I lost a couple years ago, which taught me some other valuable lessons. But there were two things that happened while I was mayor, besides the fact that I was in sales and traveling up and down the East Coast selling uh, products. There was a couple things that happened that had a major impact on what I do for a living today. One of them was Hurricane Irene. It was back in about 2011. And it wasn't the kind of storm that most people think about today when you think about like Matthew and Floyd and those other, uh, those other like Florence, if you were in Jones County area this past year, that was really bad. Um, but Hurricane Irene was a major windstorm. In fact, some people in my town were without power for seven days. Let me teach you something about, about leadership. When people were without power for one day, they kind of know the hurricane's coming, so they're kind of prepared, right? You know, you got the, the light bulbs and the radios and stuff, the ice Day two, it's okay. Come day three, people lose their minds, right? Because people, we're so used to being connected and having access to all these amenities, the idea of flipping the switch and the light not coming on or the, the food in your freezer starting to go bad, it really starts to take a, an emotional toll on people, and it creates a, a, a lot of challenges for leadership, and I learned that on day three. I was without power for day five. In fact, I even told our staff don't turn my power on first because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy in power who, who influences how we make decisions about who's going to get their electricity on first. So mine came on about day five, which my wife wasn't too happy about, but that's just the way, the way it is. Uh, but I learned a lot. But here's what, what was interesting about that experience is that during Hurricane Irene, I was actually in the emergency operations center watching our fire and police officers uh, and even National Guard do what they do best, our public services employees 
uh, handle phone calls and go go rescue people as needed, those kind of things. Uh, but my job as mayor, I'm not part of the professional staff, right? We got professionals, the city manager, police chief, fire chief, public services director. They're the ones managing the day-to-day affairs of the city. The mayor really is the conduit between the governing, the, the people, right, the, 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 the city of Kinston, the, what I call the capital C, and the community of Kinston, the little C, the people. So the, the mayor is that conduit between both in North Carolina. The mayor of New York has the authority to sign things into legislation. The mayor in most towns in North Carolina does not. Right? The mayor more, more so in North Carolina is like the chairman of the board. They kind of have a role in the direction. They have a lot of influence in the conversation. They can, they can start a debate and end debate, but when it comes down to a vote, I didn't have a vote. That's the way most mayors in our state work, not all of them. And so I found my role as to being the conduit. So I took to social media. I took to Twitter and Facebook, posted up, hey, this tree's down on this road. By the time, you know, an hour into it, people were starting to send me information about things that were happening in our our community. I was able to relay that. So instead of calling 911, it was a major emergency they did. But for little things like that, this road's closed, water's too high here, you know, uh, this car's stranded, those kind of things, I was a conduit. So by the time Hurricane Matthew came around, does anybody remember Hurricane Matthew by chance? Hurricane Matthew was a devastating flood for eastern North Carolina. Uh, I went to our EOC that night, not expecting it to be much of a big deal. The hour I was there, the storm shifted to the west, and it had a major downpour on eastern North Carolina. We experienced a lot of heavy rain. The bigger problem for a lot of us in eastern North Carolina is that that the Goldsboro, Smithfields, and Raleigh's experienced a lot of rain. So by the time that water came back down, we got all that water as well. So we got a major downpour. We had the flash flooding. Not only did we have the wind, so the power went out a lot of places, but then a few days later, we had all the flooding coming from the west of us. So we experienced three major challenges with that one. But again, I took the social media because I knew that's where a lot of the people are. Um, where, where are your cell phones right now? I'm just curious right beside you, in your pocket. All right, I expect that. When it's 3 o'clock in the morning, most of you are probably asleep, right? Uh, maybe not on the weekend, but most of you are asleep at 3 o'clock in the morning. Where is your cell phone at that point? Charger? How far is the charger from you? Uh-huh. Where else? Anybody else? Bedside table. So, so in other words, I could go like this, right? Anybody use it for your alarm? Right? So it's the last thing you look at before you go to sleep, and it's probably the first thing you look up, look at when you wake up, right? For the most part. In marketing, for those marketing majors, I'm going to tell you I call that a clue. That means I can't sell to somebody, I can't share a message as a brand or a company if I don't first have your attention, right? So if I know your eyeballs or on, 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 at least has got my phone. If I know your eyeballs are on that device, then that means if I got to figure out a way to get your attention. And that was a big thing that I learned about on social media when it came to Hurricane Matthew. There was one day I did a live right from, I had the orange barricade by, behind me, and we had had a couple people drown. We had actually had three people pass away during Hurricane Matthew, uh, not in the city, but in the county I live in. And uh, a couple of them were related to people just going around barricades. I mean, how stupid is that? And so we decided just to do a live in front of a barricade, say, hey, this is here for a reason. We didn't wake up and go, let me just put a barricade there so people can go that only the VIPs can go across it. No, this is there to keep you away because there's a, there's a major issue on the other side of this barricade. I think that video within 24 hours had about 40,000 views, more so than most of the, your, your TV stations would have. And what I found is that how powerful that device really is. And so, but here's the other problem I had. Remember I told you I was in sales? Well, when you're in commission-only sales and you have a devastating hurricane as Matthew, guess what happened to all my sales? And then I was like, well, okay, well, that's, that's no problem this week or next week. But this was a devastating hurricane. So how, what are people going to be doing for the next month, two months, or three months? And so I started going, oh, crap. My income 
in three months is still going to be down as compared to what it is right now. So I need to think about some, doing something a little bit different. Not that I wanted to leave the company I was working. I love my company. I still have membership with them. But I started thinking about something. I was like, well, I have a pretty good understanding of relationships, the B2B space, and I'm really good at social media, or at least understanding a lot of the philosophies behind why it works. And so I decided to create a company called Magic Mile Media, which basically married the, t- the two topics. It is social media marketing consulting for small businesses and organizations. Because here's what I found is that most small businesses understand that that device exists and that people are on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. But most small businesses, honestly, don't really know how to use it. I mean, think about when you go see, if you go glance at any realtor right now, I won't pick on anyone. I'll just tell you, go look at five realtors sometime over the next couple of days. And this is what most of their timeline is going to be. It's going to be, hey, we just listed this house. Look how beautiful this house is. Here's how much it is. Here's the here's some pictures of the inside. Oh, we just sold this other house. Picture of the home buyers. Congratulations to the no home buyers. Hey, we just listed this house. We just sold this house. We just listed this house. We just sold this house. And it gets really boring, right? So boring, in fact, that the way the algorithms work is that the you see more of the things that you're interested in. So if people aren't paying attention, guess what happens to that business on social media? Their engagement goes down. And so I'm more concerned about the engagement than I am about just about anything else. I want to make sure that you, I've got your attention so I can share. So I, tell, so, so I tell realtors all the time, I'd prefer you go interview the local elementary school principal or the police chief or, or walk the beat with your dog and just show your dog walking at that neighborhood and show that you're the neighborhood expert more so than buying, I mean, listening, selling all these houses because people already know that that's what you do for a living. But what they really want to know is, will I be, would I like, do I like know and trust you enough to actually buy a house from you? And I think that's more important when it comes to social media. So that was kind of how I started doing the Magic Mile Media was I started doing that. And so I started diving a lot into uh, helping uh, small business figure that out. Uh, got a handful of clients. So I changed my, my model of my income. I went from more or less a commission base that I, I make a commission every time I sell something to, hey, I'm on retainer every month, whether there's a hurricane or not. Does that make sense? And that was why I was like, now, that is the direction I want to go. So I'm building, I'm building a book of business via retainer. So when I come take a Monday to come to ECU, guess what? There's still invoices being sent and there's still checks being delivered because I'm still delivering on the, on what I promised my clients. Does that make sense? So in terms of my business model, that's the way I decided to make it. About a year and a half into that, um, where's that newspaper? I had a newspaper earlier. Okay. So the East Carolinian, which was, I'm glad it's still around. It was around, I I graduated here in in 2002. Um, But how many of you subscribe to your local paper at home? One, two, maybe. In marketing, I would call that a clue. Local news is really important. Local journalism is really important. What the East Carolinian, East Carolinian and what these students do is very important. They're learning some really valuable skills, but also sharing some really quality content that students and faculty and teachers and families alike need to know. Agree? Everybody agree with that? So whether you read it or not, there are enough people who are interested in it that it still makes it worth their time to actually put the time and effort and energy to sell the ads, to put this content together, to actually take it and actually put it on a piece of paper uh, in color and then distribute it throughout the, all, the whole campus, right? It's got enough people's attention to still do that. Most local newspapers in, in our country are losing 5 10 15 percent subscriber rates year after year after year after year. Do you know why? don't have their attention and the reason why people they don't have people's attention anymore is because you're too busy looking at what your phones right so about a year and a half into this idea of changing what I was doing for a living I started noticing that going well if anybody's ever going to take a stab at trying to fix this local news issue I, I'm in a position to because at that point I had lost my the 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 I lost the race, I won, I won, and then I lost. 
So then I gained about 15, 20 hours a week of my time, right? I was like, well, if I was ever going to figure out a, a time to try to figure this piece out, now's the time for me to put my thoughts on paper, call a few friends, figure out, is this, a, is this an idea worth pursuing or not? And so that's what we did. And we created something called News News after the News River. And I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, alliteration. So it was Magic Mile Media and News News. Who knows what I'll do next? Um, but uh, News News basically is the idea of taking everything that's in this, this document and plastering it everywhere. We got a seven o'clock daily email that's automatic. I'm a big fan of systems. There are two full-time people that work for us and we've put out probably close to 3,000 pieces of content in 16 months. Do the math on that for a second. There's two full-time people and we've put out about 3,000 pieces of content in 16 months. And not only did we put that content on our website, it's emailed out every single morning, right? It's free. So when you get the email and you click on something, you don't have to have a subscription. It's free. When you go to our social media account, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram story, we're putting it all, is that, is that five places? We're putting in all those places too. When you click on a link to go read the story, whether that is uh, something political or uh, uh, traditional news or education or local high school sports, you can read it and it's free. How do you think I'm able to afford to do that? Anybody want to take a guess? Yes. Advertisement. So from a business perspective, here was my bet that if I gave away content, then I would catch people's attention more quickly, right? And that if I could do that fast enough, then I could go and manage a handful of relationships with business owners, right? Versus trying to manage 1,000, 2,000, 4,200 daily email subscribers is what we're up to now in Little Old Kinston. So instead of me having to manage one to two, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month from these 4,200 subscribers, now all I've got to do is manage 25, 50, 100 relationships with business owners who are paying a lot more than four or five dollars a month. Does that make sense? So I'm able to grow fast, manage fewer relationships through ads. Now, the only trick for me, as I said, is we're not doing pop-up ads. You know why we're not doing pop-up ads? Because I hate them. Anybody go to a pop-up ad on a, on a screen and your thumbs just a, hits it just wrong and you end up clicking the ad and not Xing out? I said, I'm not, I don't want people to have a negative experience with our, with our site. So there's no pop-up ads. No, another thing we, do, we don't do is we don't do AP news. So, so if you want to find out what's going on in the impeachment hearing today, I promise you there's 10,000 other sources you can find that information from. Twitter being a really good one, right? You can find out what's, not only what the national networks are saying, but all the reporters and the political insiders are saying about it. You don't need us to tell you what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, right? But, but when it comes to the, the parrot is playing in the state championship game against Raleigh Grace Christian, Guess what we did for that game two weeks ago? We live-streamed it on Facebook with a 20-year-old and a 19-year-old in front of the camera the entire game with their cute little coats and bow ties and the microphones and headset. And we had a camera on the field doing, the, doing the, the each, each snap of the ball. We had another camera as a wide angle, another camera on the scoreboard, another camera on them, and we moved in between the shots the whole game. You go back and look at it. Uh, I don't know how many views we got on it, but people paid attention to it because people want to know what's happening with their local high school football team. Does that make sense? And, of course, we do other stories. So that's news news. So those are the two businesses I've created. So I want to kind of go into a little bit about, now you have a little bit better idea about me, some, some of the philosophies that things have driven me to get where I am today. And my hope is that some of these will help you, especially as we think about a lot of the part of this class are, are soft skills uh, that, that maybe some philosophies and things I've done can share with you today can help you. Uh, one of them is uh, relationships. Relationships are greater than money. A lot of people, when they get out of school, they want to make a lot of money. That might be a life goal for you, and that's really good. And I'm going to tell you that today's currency has more to do with, more to do with how good of relationships you've got 
than how good how how much money you want to make. I think there's more value in not burning a bridge than there is in having a dollar in your pocket. Relationships are greater than money. When you get when you get out of here and you go interview somewhere, you're gonna put down three references, right? I would imagine that those are gonna be good references. And I'm gonna tell you that no one's gonna to agree to be a reference for you if you haven't proven yourself to them or they don't trust you. I'm not gonna give somebody a reference unless unless I trust that person. And then once I, once I say yes to it, it's a blanket yes. Anytime that person needs me as reference, I'm always there. But the person who's making the call to me as the reference, they're always going to understand that I'm going to say good things about that person too. So that's why I said I was curious about you with resumes because I'm going to look you up on social media regardless, your, your real account and your fake account. I'm going to find you, right? Because it's what I do. I know. Uh, relationships are greater than money. Trust is greater than skill, right? So you might be really good at accounting. You might be very, very good at marketing. But if I can't trust you, we can't do business. If I sense that in our interview, I'm not going to hire you. It really is that simple. I've made a lot, at least I'll tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes here lately. Some HR, I'm learning a lot about HR right now. Um, and, and it ranges in age, right? Um, so it's not about young people or old people. I'm learning a lot. But I will tell you that when it comes down to it, the only people I want working with me or that I want to work with are people that I trust. Because when we go to battle, when we go to war, I need to know, do you have my back? Because I promise you I've got yours. And in business, that means a lot, right? It means a lot. Uh, the last one on the philosophies there are, are doers are greater than complainers. I hate whining so much that if you ask, I got two kids. My wife, Jessica, went here, by the way. She's a recreational therapist by trade. She's a, an, uh, an exceptional children's teacher now. She's got a class of seven autistic kids. God bless her. You know she's got the patience to do that because she puts up with me. So uh, she, she, she and I have two daughters, Grayson's 11 uh, and Catherine's seven. And uh, if you ask my kids, what does daddy not like? They'll both will tell you in unison, hopefully, that it is not like whining. I'm not big on complaining. Uh, we talked about earlier, Miss Carol and Aletha, uh, about entitlement. You're not entitled to a job, right? You're not entitled to a good living. You're not entitled to the white picket fence with a 3,000 square foot house, two car garage with the Lexus and Land Rover. You're not entitled to any of it. You got to earn it. If you earn it and you got it, awesome. I'm, I'm going to be on the sideline cheering you on, right? But you got to earn it. And the way you don't do it is by complaining about what's going on in life. So when I have issues, you don't hear me complain. I go, okay, here's my issue. How do I fix it? So I, I spend less time on worrying about it and chewing on the negative impact of it and more go, okay, well, here's the reality that we're living in. Here's the facts. How do I, how do I fix it? How do we get past this? And I think that's actually a part of the reason why we, I had so much fun being mayor because there was always a challenge, whether it was the, the, uh, the guys on the truck didn't pick up this person's garbage or the, the neighbor's dog was barking to, we had to figure out how to get out of the flooding situation we're in. So I was always looking at the challenges, trying to figure out how to solve it. Doers are greater than complainers. Um, on, uh, I know there was a topic Ms. Carol wanted me to mention, and then I'll get into some Q&A, uh, and that was about the, your first job at Career Advice. How many of y'all are seniors again? I want to see your seniors. How many of you seniors, this is your last semester? Okay, so everybody's graduating. Oh, okay, you got one senior. Where, where are you going back after this, this semester? Riley. Riley, do you know what you want to do? You, you have a job lined up, or are you going to figure it out? Awesome, awesome. Uh, and those graduating the spring, do you already know what you're going to do or, or you, you got to figure it out? I was in the spot where I just had to figure it out, right? I didn't say so I was the first in my family to ever go to college besides my sister, who we ended up graduating at the same time. I had no clue what I was doing. I still don't some days. Um, but it was my junior year that I started figuring some of these things out. Um, but when it comes to your first job and career advice, maybe some of the things I've mentioned to are, are 
are good. But uh, y'all see uh, y'all see Lee earlier, uh, Dr. Grubb, uh, fanning the door. And I picked on him and I said, I'm actually going to talk about that later. And it's because, uh, going back to the entitlement thing, uh, I, as an employer, as a leader, have more of a servant leader mentality than I think, I, I don't know, compared to most or not. It's just, it's just who I am. Meaning, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be just as willing to get down and scrub this floor if someone spills coffee on it as the next, as the janitor might, right? Because I'm a big believer that I'm never going to ask somebody to do something that either I'm not willing to do or, or haven't already done myself. And so just watching him fan that door seems such a menial task, and it's still warm in this room, but it was a nice gesture on his part. Does that make sense? And I, I'd be just as willing to do that or go grab a fan somewhere down the hall to come in here just as, just as well as, the, as figuring out how the air conditioner works. And that's kind of that's how I am as a leader. And I, what I, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is don't expect to walk in and get that $36,000, $46,000, $56,000 job and that you're at the top of the pole. No, you're at the bottom. And you're going to have to do some crap work to prove your worth. And I, I would encourage you to say yes to more of the challenges there than, no, I, I can't do that. It's not my job description. Because if you find ways to say yes and you get the job done, then you're going to have a better chance of rising that corporate ladder if that's the life you want to choose. When I was at ECU and we went toward the bb &T facility, the headquarters in Winston-Salem, which I, I believe is moving to Charlotte with a name change soon, uh, I realized that banking was not for me. Corporate world was not for me. And I knew that there was some way I was going to figure out how to be my own boss. And I will tell you, that's not easy. It's sexy to be an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be their own boss, have their own things. And I'm going to tell you, I work a lot. But I have fun because I'm not going to go through life not being happy. I'm more concerned about, am I happy? Is Aletha happy? Is my wife happy? Uh, are are the, the, my team members happy? Because if you're not happy, we're going to find another role for you. Or you might have to go somewhere else. Or I got to figure out something else to do for a living because I only got one shot at this life, and I just want to be happy while I'm doing it. No reason to be miserable. Does that make sense? Anybody know somebody who's, who works in a miserable career? I just, that's not me. I don't want to do that. That's not how, that's not how I want to live. Um, one thing I'll say uh, is that you, you might have goals. I mean, certainly graduating is one of those goals, right? I would hope so, at least. Uh, I would hope another um, standard of living, though, would be like brushing your teeth. And I know you just went like, what do you mean by that, BJ? So my kids, it is a daily and nightly, did you, did you brush your hair? Did you take a bath or shower? Did you brush your hair? Did you brush your teeth, right? I'm drilling that into them. It's, I mean, it's a daily conversation to the point that they start telling me, hey, Dad, I've already done those, those three things. Well, it's because I need that to be a standard of living for them. Does that make sense? So much as the standard of living for you now that I hope that you don't think twice about it. You just do it, right? It's not a goal anymore. But at one time in their life, in your life, those kind of things were goals. But you might have other goals, whether that's to be a millionaire or to help a, a thousand you know, homeless people in your backyard, to, to travel in the world and helping people. I was watching a, a, an interview with Bill Gates last night. His second phase of his career is helping uh, eradicate polio. And I'm just thinking that's an awesome career to have, right? It, it doesn't really matter what those goals are. Once you achieve that goal, then that is now the standard of, of life for you. Does that make sense? Anybody an Eagle Scout in here by chance? I, I, I have those conversations with Eagle Scouts all the you don't, you, you don't, I was an Eagle Scout, you always are, right? When people stop me in the grocery store or at the restaurant, they still refer to me as mayor. Not because I'm the current mayor, but because that standard is always there. That I have to always understand that people will always look at me like that. And so that is not a goal anymore. My goal is to provide hyperlocal free news to as many people as I possibly can and then take that model and duplicate it across the country. Because I think small town USA, Ohio, California, New York, Nebraska – need some type of local news model like we're building that you can give away content for free and have it on that really cool device. The last one I'm, I want to uh, mention, uh, and then I, I really want y'all to think about some, some Q&A. If you got some questions, I'd love to help or, or challenges. I'd love to talk to you about those. Uh, and that is, 
my life changed around 23, 24 when I discovered personal development, meaning that what Ms. Carroll, Dr. Grubb, uh, Professor Aikens, what, what all these people are trying to pour into you now will only last for a short bit. Once you leave here in December, you won't, you won't think much about your different professors, uh, except for the impact they had on you. They're not going to be giving you instruction anymore. And once I learned the idea that there are ways to continue learning and continue growing, it had an absolute major impact on my life. It was when I learned the combination of five principles meaning that the five people I hang around the most, uh, that I'm actually a combination of those five. You know, are they doing good things for my life or bad things for my life? And do I need them in my life? I started having, analyzing those kind of thoughts. I changed a couple of people who I hung around the most, had, a, had an incredibly positive impact on my life. And so by studying people who've been more successful than I have, have been, whether that's in religion or whether that's in business or whether that's in marriage, or whether that's in you enter the input the blank insert the blank there, no matter what it is you're trying to get better at, I promise you somebody's already done it, right? Or has helped build a model for you to study outside of school. And I'm gonna tell you when I learned that, when I figured that out, it had a major positive impact on my life through personal development. Uh, a guy named uh, Gary Vaynerchuk is somebody I follow now. Anybody heard of him, Gary V? Uh, if you're if you're in marketing, I encourage you to look him up. Um, a guy named Jim Rohn, he's a philosopher, who, business philosopher since passed. He taught me a lot about, about, about life and business philosophy. When I learned personal development, it absolutely changed my life. Um, so that's kind of how, that's kind of my story. Some of the thoughts I want to, I want to leave you. I'd be curious to hear uh, from you. Any, any questions you have for me? Yes, sir. Do all of your life experiences. Uh, what would be the biggest piece of advice that you would tell your 25-year-old self now? Hmm. Run for office again. Running for office at 25 for me uh, was defining for me because I didn't think I could do it, and I did it anyway. I put my I was very vulnerable, right? You put your name on a ballot, and you ask people to vote for you, and you ask people for money. Let me tell you something. You find out who your friends are real quick. Are they willing to put a sign in your yard, in their yard? No, it doesn't mean we're not friends, but it, it, I was, I was really, I was vulnerable. Uh, and my wife took it a lot harder than I did, right? She was the one who was carrying that emotional weight where I was just doing. Uh, so at 25, I would tell BJ, run for office again. It, even though it was kind of a scary moment, scary thought, the idea that I was going against two men that I absolutely adore and respect. Even with that, uh, I would make all the mistakes all over again. It was worth it. Uh, so I would 100% do it all over again. I was talking to a teacher before, and she talked about how uh, she was working on a scholarship committee, and they would give out scholarships ranging from 25 to a million dollars. And she did this for like 12 years. And a lot of people wouldn't apply for scholarships because they would think that they wouldn't get it. To right. the point where I think she said that they were willing to give out more than uh, 100 scholarships a year. And one year, they only have four people apply. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's to the point where you think that you're not good enough to do something or you feel that you're not worthy enough or you just don't have that support system. She said you should always find it in yourself, no matter what, to apply for that scholarship or apply for that internship or even running for mayor, if you don't feel like you're gonna win because you just never know, and there's always people supporting you, if, even if they might not be right in front of you, you don't clearly see that. There's always someone supporting you, or you should be supporting yourself. So What's your name? name? Curtis Martin. Curtis, uh, you're, you're spot on. And, and in fact, you see this in the vanity metrics of social media today. You know, I'd like Instagram started uh, this week reducing how many people can see hearts and stuff. Facebook, you can still see. You can, you, you can actually click and see who actually liked it or hated it or whatever. Uh, what I've learned about social media is that no matter it's 10 people or 10,000 people that like something, there's a lot more people who, who saw it, who may like it, who just didn't click the button. There's a lot more people supporting you than sometimes your self-doubt will, will, will let you think so. And I will tell you that 
Um, I'm very self-aware of who I am and where I want to go to the point that the adversity a lot of times doesn't phase me as much as it may the next person because my intent, my intent is always pure, right? Trying to provide a service to people, whether that's um, social media marketing for a small business or a free local news for a community, the intent is to provide a really valuable service and do it so that uh, there's a fair exchange of, of money. In my case, advertising on one end and working with clients over here. But the intent is to provide it at the best um, possible rate of return for, for them, not for me. Right? So I just said, I'm giving up a lot for somebody else. To go back to my point earlier, I said I was going to explain why the video camera's here. Abby, Abby's here. She's, uh, what year are you at ECU? Um, still back in Virginia. All right. So I reached out and said, hey, I, I'm, I'm speaking to ECU on this day. I, I need a videographer. And her husband reached out to me and connected with me, and she's here today. The reason why I'm videoing has less, to, even though I'm the one in front of the room with the microphone, it has, it has zero to do with BJ. Yes, I might put on my website. Yes, I might put on YouTube or throw a snippet on Instagram with the cool little captions and whatnot. Yes, I'll do that, but it has nothing to do with me. And you're going, BJ, that sounds so vain, and yet I, I'm really confused. It's because of a couple things I mentioned here earlier to this table. One is I'm driving the ship for my business. I'm leading. I'm out front. And maybe there's something I say that helps you today, and maybe the person that is really going to help is not even in this room. So by taking this content and putting it somewhere else, maybe somebody who's really meant to hear it is not even in this room today. Does that make sense? The other part of it is my grandfather, my dad was the youngest of 12, right? Uh, and my grandfather was a Baptist minister in Kinston. I never met him. He, he, he died 10 years before I was born. And he also started a fish market, which still exists today. My, my first cousin and his cousin run it. If I could go back in time and just hang out with him for 10 minutes, you know, kind of sit in a rocking chair and just hang out, man, I'd love to pick his brain. And the thought that maybe the technology existed that 40, 60 years ago, somebody could have put a microphone on him while he was preaching or handling the affairs of his fish market, and the idea that I'd be able to watch that today, man, that would thrill my soul. It's, it's not about me. It's about everybody else. So that's why the camera's here. Does that make sense? It's a good point. Any other questions? Go for it, Curtis. Um, the idea of you starting your own uh, newspaper business, well, sort of kind of like a newspaper business, mm -hmm. came from you being a uh, mayor. Um, it was that situation where the hurricane came through and you got on Twitter and people started sending you, um, I guess, caution here, caution there. Right. Kind of gave you the idea of putting information into one place. Is it out for free? It was the experience that people, um, that people, are, they're connected on those devices and that all people really want is accurate information and they want it fast, right? You don't want fast, wrong information, Right? because then you become an unreliable source. But if I can give you accurate information fast, then you become somebody who's trustworthy. And my thought was there's a void in the market between local content not actually being produced in the platforms that people are actually paying attention to. That how many of you, all, when was the last time you actually went and put 50, 75 cents in a coin machine to pull out a paper? Even the East Carolinian gives it away for free right? It cost him a lot of money to do that. So my thought was there's a void. How do we take what's on this piece of paper that someone's going to pay 75 cents for and give it to them for free, but in a, in a, in a spot where they can actually pay attention to it? And because the, the content is still good. The value. It, it was me seeing a void in the market and using the experiences I had as mayor uh, actually helped me create the network of relationships to actually launch something like that. I didn't do it by myself. I have a lot of people helping I actually, that's, that's a good point. I've actually was spending some time this weekend looking in, into that. Yes, it's coming. 
Any other questions before y'all get out of here? Don't be mad if you're the one that's asking the question and y'all have to wait another 30 seconds to leave. Any other questions or thoughts? All right, so to you seniors, um, the admonition is relationships are greater than money. Your LinkedIn is important. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll, 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 I'll friend you, and we'll help each other along the way. It's BJ Murphy 360. Uh, same goes for, for the, the juniors here. Uh, I'll help you any way I can. It's the reason why I'm here. That's why I'm taking a, a few hours out of my day to come here instead of working on client stuff right now uh, because I genuinely want to see you all succeed. Uh, because my, one of my missions is to help as many people as I possibly can, and I believe that if I'm able to achieve that, I'm going to be happy and fulfilled along the way. Does that make sense? So I want you all to study hard, get good grades, and if I can help you, just reach out. All right, Miss Carol, do you have anything else to add? All right, you all have a good day. Thank you.